Thank you. Thank you. You guys are the survivors who survived today, went through the whole thing, and you're back to see Marty, right? Yeah. It's fantastic. So cheers to you guys. You guys are great. So, uh, you know, um, a lot of times in product management, you hear a lot of stories, and, and Marty's got an incredible wealth of stories, and today he's going to share some of his knowledge about product, um, but really invite you to take a deep listen, really kind of think about what he's saying. Um, more importantly, if you've, got, uh, if you've got questions, I think he's going to stick around just a little bit um, after you can catch him on the way out. Um, but uh, definitely pick up his book, Inspired. Some of you might have gotten a copy of Inspired and brought it in, and uh, I invite you to dig into that. It's one of the books that I have at home. In fact, I have the old version, the original version, and, uh, and I, I find myself opening it up every time I'm about to do some product training because the lessons learned in that book and, and lessons that, that Marty shares are simply incredible. And if they're not part of what you're coaching or what you're teaching or what you're doing, you're making a big mistake. The things that he has to share within that book really are, are uh, still impactful to, uh, to so many people on your teams, impactful to me personally. So with that said, I'd like to uh, invite you up to see uh, Marty Kagan and definitely tweet the stuff out and send it out because, uh, because others who might be missing this, um, they're missing a big, big bunch. So with that, Marty Kagan. Well, thanks for coming, and Stacy, thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, normally I actually talk to developers and designers and product managers. That's kind of my main crowd. But uh, occasionally I'm asked to talk to at Agile gatherings and conferences, and I actually really like that. I don't do it nearly as much, but I really like that. And I'll tell you why. It's because, in my experience, the people that come to this really are just, what they're really passionate about is helping teams. They really get into it. There's a lot better paying roles, so it's usually because they really want to help teams, which, uh, I mean, I feel like that's what I want to do too, and so I feel like I'm kind of, you're my, my tribe. And so I'm grateful that you came. Now, I will say, you know, one of the things, I only have an hour with you, and I, I don't want to waste the time. I'm going to be blunt through a lot of this. Uh, there are two things I see that get in the way of you actually being able to help teams. And these are both kind of rough. The first is so many people who are really responsible. It is their job to coach teams. The honest truth is most of them have never seen good. They're literally, they've seen bad all over, and they can cite that, but they've never been lucky enough to see good which makes it really hard, because you can talk in theory about this stuff, but it's really hard, especially if you find yourself at a company with some pretty capable people that want to get better. And so I do, if you ever get a chance in your, uh, in your work, in your travels, to spend even days, even a, a week, with teams at Netflix, or teams at Amazon, or teams at Google, or uh, teams at Apple, it can totally change your world. Because the way they work is not how the vast majority of companies work, which really is what I'm going to talk about. So, and you know, that's just, that's just reality. It's really hard to do if you haven't seen good. The second thing is um, there's a lot of religion in the Agile world. And that religion will, will really get in the way of you helping teams. And so I try very hard. I've actually been a very vocal advocate for Agile since way back, probably since most of you have been doing it. But, um, but I also will be honest with you, if something better comes along tomorrow, I'm on it. So I, you don't want to be religious on this stuff. New things come all the time. And I've seen so many things come and go. So um, yeah, if you really want to help teams, those are the two things you want to be really careful about and aware of. And, and sort of that's what tees up this talk. What I really wanted to talk about here is um, the difference between most teams and really the teams you want to work on and help, the really great teams, the ones that are really doing products that you know and love. 
There, it, it's dramatic, and I want to be clear, I'm not talking like Silicon Valley versus uh, the Northwest. Nothing could be further from the truth. My world is mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you only have to go across the street to find companies that are working in the old way. It's not about geography. In fact, some of my favorite teams today are in Stockholm, they're in Berlin, they're in Bangalore, they're in Shanghai, Shenzhen, they're just all over. So it's, it's not about location. All right. Now, what I normally love to talk about is this, product discovery. Uh, that's the term I use, number of people use it, but it's the term, it, it really, this is how good product teams solve hard problems, which to me, that's why I got into this. That's probably what you got into helping teams do that. Really, how do they solve hard problems? Uh, that book I wrote is all about the techniques to do that. We basically have four kinds of risks in all uh, product work. We're trying to come up with a solution that's valuable. People will buy it or choose to use it. It's usable. It's feasible. We can build it with the technology stack we have, with the skills on our team, with the time we have. We can afford to build it. And we, uh, it's viable. It works for the different parts of our business, sales, marketing, uh, services, finance, legal, compliance. That's, that's what we're looking for, a solution with those characteristics. Now, we have many kinds of prototypes. MVP is kind of a, a generic term for the different kinds of prototypes we use. And we have a whole family of quantitative and qualitative methods to help us figure out if what we want to build is worth building. And that is a pro that's what, that's product discovery, and that's how product teams do great work. And I, honestly, I find that all across all the best companies. They don't always call it discovery, but they're always doing those things. They're tackling those problems. So here's the unfortunate uh, reality is I, and especially because I wrote a whole book on this, but the reality is I'm, I, I coach a lot of teams. Uh, mostly I advise you know, the, the uh, CEOs and the head of product, but I end up coaching a lot of teams and um, it's actually not that hard to show them the te techniques great companies learn. It's not even that hard for them to learn those techniques and even show me they can do it. And what really kills me, though, is how many companies I find out are not actually able to run that way. They literally don't allow their teams to work this way, which, which to me is a bit of like, this is crazy. I want to understand why in the world, if they've got the right people with the skills, why would they not do that? And that's what I really want to talk about here. I, I made it a point once, I've realized that for a while, but this year, literally 2019, I started a major focus, not so much on the techniques to do product work, but on fixing this problem, on getting companies to actually let their teams do good work, which sounds so ridiculously obvious. But I think, as you'll see, it's pretty rare. So let's talk for a minute about product teams, because that everything happens. All innovation happens in product teams. It's not, you know, innovation is not an individual sport, it's a team sport. It, and I mean that, and that's not a buzzword. It is a team sport. So there's really three kinds of product teams. Most of the teams out there, if I'm honest with myself, even though I really don't like this fact, they're delivery teams. Uh, also known as scrum teams, dev teams. Uh, if you're using something like safe for less, this is what you have. And those teams are, they, they're not cross-functional, first of all. They, they often say they are, but to them that means they have front-end and back-end engineers. That makes them cross-functional. Of course, that's not what we mean by cross-functional. Product, real product, real design, and real engineering, that's the core of a cross-functional team. So they're not cross-functional. Uh, they're also mercenaries. They're just there to crank out features. They're basically feature factories. And some processes are really good about cranking out features, which is just, uh, that is not how innovation happens. It is also not how any of the great companies work. So, but that is very common. I understand. It comes from, 
you know, there's a lot of custom software out there. There's a lot of traditional IT out there. But anyway, delivery teams, I don't know what to do about them. I think you just kind of have to let those companies run their course. Some of them, Amazon will annihilate. Some of them, Amazon will put the fear of God into the leaders and they'll get serious. But that most of the companies I meet that say they want to transform, that's what they're actually coming from. Okay, they're used to delivery teams. It's not that hard to do delivery teams. The second kind of team is a little more interesting. These are feature teams. This is where, you know, in Spotify lingo, these are squads. And squads actually look a lot like the third type I'll describe, which are empowered product teams. They look very familiar because a squad has got a product, or at least somebody with a title product manager, somebody with a title product designer, or user experience designer, and a set of engineers. And I should have mentioned one of the telling characteristics of a delivery team is they actually don't have a product manager, they just have a product owner. And uh, in that model, the product owner is a backlog administrator. Somebody's got to do it, somebody's got to spend time on Jira every day, but that's not the product role. On a feature team, we usually have somebody with the title product manager, but sadly, they're really project managers. You probably see this a lot. Um, they're project managers. Now, a feature team really is cross-functional, so that's good. And a lot of companies check the transformation box because they move from the delivery team model into the feature team model. Um, they don't call them feature teams. Of course, they call them squads or product teams, but they're really feature teams. By that, I mean, yes, they're cross-functional, that's good, but they are given roadmaps, and their job is to implement features and projects on the roadmap, which means they're outcome-based teams. Not so, oh, listen to me. They're output-based teams, not outcome-based teams. Output just like in the delivery teams. That's not what we need. So they're mercenaries. They're there to build. In fact, this is often described as uh, the team is there to serve the business, literally to serve the business. If you hear that phrase, it's a telltale sign it's a feature team. On the other hand, the third kind is an empowered product team. This is really what I'm all about. This is where, what, I, and I got this, I didn't invent any of this, so this is just, this is how good companies work. And when I say good companies are way different than most companies, this is the heart of what I'm referring to. These empowered product teams now, they're still a squad, but now they actually have a product manager that's not just a project manager. It's a real product manager, and it's a full-on product designer, skilled in service design, uh, interaction design, visual design, user research, we've got that, and we've got the full range of engineers. And more than that, the engineers are not just there to code, they are there also to invent. In an empowered product team, we say, if you're only using your developers to code, you're only getting about half their value. It's really true. In a feature team, they're just there to code. In a delivery team, they're absolutely there to code. So I'm really talking here about an empowered product team. And this is not a new concept. I'm going to uh, flesh that out here in a minute. It is not a new concept, but for Various reasons, I have theories, but who really knows, most companies don't do it, even though the consistently best companies in the world do. And that's what I want to really dig into today. I want to talk about this idea of empowered product teams, and I want to talk about what's really necessary for an organization to change. In my view, in the next few minutes, you're going to see, and I hope it's going to be very clear, you're going to see the major reason why the vast majority of companies that are doing the so-called digital transformations, it's just a farce. All they're doing is checking the box and getting to feature teams. They're not really transforming, and I think you'll see why. Because transformation really means moving to this. All right. I, again. I didn't invent any of this stuff. In fact, it's amazing to me, when I started this focus last year, um, 
First thing I did was sort of gather a reading list. Some of these books I'd read, bef I'd read but many of them I found as, as part of my uh, looking deeper into this. And these are great books. If you haven't read any of them, I would strongly recommend. They are really good books. Uh, and they all make the argument for empowered teams. And a lot of these are popular books, too. It's not like these are obscure. They make the argument for empowered teams. Yet, most companies don't. They don't do it. And I really wanted to understand why. Now, I had some theories of this, but what I started doing last year is I started asking the CEOs of those companies that I knew had people that were capable or had at least been trained to work the way we're talking about, yet they weren't being allowed to work that way. And the answer I consistently heard, not always out loud, but pretty obviously, was trust. The leaders don't trust the teams. Now, it's also true that in many cases, the, the teams aren't really trustworthy, in fairness. They haven't demonstrated that they really can do what's necessary in an empowered team. And a lot of CEOs are all, you know, will point that out. But of course, I point back to them, who hired these people? I mean, it's the, the leaders are the ones that hired those people, and so if they can't trust them, it's really on them. But fundamentally, I do understand that if you want a CEO to really empower, and, and that's a big power shift, to go from command and control to empowered teams. It is, you're asking a lot of the leaders of a company, the executives, the stakeholders, the CEO, and they, I understand they really need to have people they believe in and are willing. And it's not an indefinite thing, you know, you earn that trust forever, it's always sort of being earned. But that's the big issue. These teams are not trusted. And especially, to, to put a you know, fine point on it, the product manager is usually the one that's the most problematic as far as that trust. Now, it is a super hard job, we're gonna get into that. It is not like the project manager on a feature team. It's a hard job, so I understand that, but I'm gonna talk about how those product managers need to demonstrate their ability to do this. All right, trust though is at the heart of this. Now, I have actually talked about the difference between those companies that are uh, awesome. At cons when I say awesome, what I'm really measuring that by is consistent innovation for our customers in ways that work for our business. That's really why they pay for product teams. Again, strong product managers, strong designers, strong engineers. That's what they're looking for. So I usually describe that as the difference between a product culture and something else. IT culture is often used or project mindset versus product mindset. You may have heard that phrase. It goes by lots of things. More accurately, it's the difference between what is the purpose of the teams. In a, in, in a good, empowered product team company, the purpose of the team is to uh, solve problems for our, for solve problems in ways our customers love, yet work for the business, and in a feature team, they're there to serve the business. Fundamentally, that's what's going on. But then I realized as I'm digging in th into this that culture isn't really the right point here. Culture's a part of the mix, and don't get me wrong, I'm very big on culture, but it's not really it, and here's why. Check out these three companies that everybody knows, probably in the world. If you've been into each of these three companies like I have, but many of you probably have at least visited them, you know they have radically different cultures, extremely different cultures. I drew it like this on purpose. Amazon's sort of on one end of the spectrum. Google's kind of on the other end of the spectrum, culture-wise, and Apple's somewhere in the middle. But they are radically different cultures. Yet, all three of these companies 
live the empowered team model. They live it. This is, this is how they built their companies, in fact, on that model. And so to me, so this was made it very clear. So culture is not quite right. There's more to this. And one of the things I realized, uh, and I started sort of pointing out to people over the last year, is that they all three have this guy in common. And it's a, it's a really beautiful irony that we're here at Nike, which is a, just a gorgeous campus, because Bill Campbell was known as the coach of Silicon Valley. And for those who don't know, he literally was a football coach at Columbia University, which is not a football powerhouse, he would be the first to admit. And in fact, he also said he was a pretty bad coach. But he moved to Silicon Valley as a young man he worked actually at Claris, if you remember that. That was part of Apple, that became part of Apple. He ended up being CEO of Intuit. He, after that, he just, he had done very well by the, in the industry, and he just wanted to do like you. He just wanted to help others. In fact, uh, unlike you and me, um, he didn't charge. He didn't even, do you know that Google tried to force him to take some shares? He ended up eventually taking some shares and donated it all. Uh, but he, is, he just did it for the love of helping organizations. He wouldn't help anybody, just the ones that he liked. Interestingly, this guy, this guy personally coached Steve Jobs for a decade. He coached Larry and Sergey for a decade, and he coached Bezos. Not hardly anybody knows this. Three of the absolute best tech companies, actually their leaders, their founders, had the same coach. Now he was not coaching them on Scrum, obviously. He was coaching them on how to build a great organization that can consistently innovate. I, did, I wish I could tell you he coached me. I met him several times. I was never one of those lucky people. Some of you know Ben Horowitz, he was. Many people I know were. The lucky thing for me is that two of my managers were actually coached by him. So I grew up in the industry with sort of his lessons. I heard him almost every week. And I feel like I benefited greatly from his teaching. In fact, I think he would love that the people that he coached actually passed it on. So I'm sort of proof of that. But um, just to, it's sort of hard to describe. He unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. But he, it's hard to describe his personality. This quote, I, there's a lot of great quotes uh, from him that I have. This quote, I think, captures one of my favorite parts about this and very much what we're talking about. Leadership is about recognizing the greatness in everyone and the leader's job is to create an environment where that greatness can emerge. Now that might sound corny to you. I, I admit it kind of sounds a little sappy. But I would argue that is exactly what Apple, Amazon, and Google do. They, they have their own way of doing that, but that's what they do. And that's really what great product companies do. I actually, when I first started Silicon Valley Product Group, which was, I had finished up at eBay, this was 15 years ago, and I, um, I wanted to start writing. And he had had such a big influence on me that I uh, reached out to him and asked if I could, I, I wrote an article. I, for those that don't know, I do publish quite a few articles. And I wrote an article about his teachings. And I sent it to him, and it, by the way, it was incredibly glowing. As you might imagine, there was no critique at all. And, uh, and I said, do you mind if I share this? Because I think, you know, there's more people need to hear your message. And his answer was, please don't publish it. He didn't want any of the attention on him. He wanted the attention on the people he coaches. And if you Google him, you'll find very little because he was consistent on that until he died. And um, of course, now I figure he can't say no, so I publish all kinds of things. <laughs> but he, uh, he had one of the most beautiful and largest uh, memorial services in, in Silicon Valley that I had ever seen. Because he touched so many people in the industry 
across so many different companies. So, in fact, you could imagine how uh, Google, Steve Jobs and Larry Page, they hated the fact that they both had a same common board member and they were so competitive on so many things. And, but Bill Campbell told them each, if you make me choose, neither of you are going to like what I decide. And so they all just bit their tongue and let him be on both boards. But uh, this is really what I'm talking about. This kind of uh, mindset. So in order to move to this model, and if you really want to really meaningfully transform, and most of the CEOs that I meet, they're, they're kind of at that point. They either feel like they have to, usually because of Amazon, or they just feel like that's what they need to do to build and take care of their customers going forward. So there, it's not trivial, though. A lot of people think that the way you scale product work is with process. And I would argue you couldn't be further from the truth. None of the great product companies scale their agile work with process. They all scale it with people. And that's really what I'm, that's my, that's what I advocate as well. That's what we're talking about here. So, in fact, one of the things I love about Bezos is every year in his shareholder letter, he warns companies about falling into that trap of focusing on process. It's incredibly dangerous. So let's talk about the role of leadership and then the role of management. And of course, I'm, I'm calling those out separately. It is true that sometimes it's the same people, our leaders and managers. Most, most uh, leaders are also managers, but they don't have to be. And I think part of the problem is people uh, conflate the two. And then we'll get down to talking about the people on an actual product team and what is necessary. But the big takeaway from, uh, hopefully you'll take away from today, is that great product companies, they are able to get great results from very normal people. It is actually not at all about the so-called 10Xer or rock star, not about that at all. I'll give you some data from that as we go on. All right, let's talk about the role of leadership and how it's different from management. For those that don't know this guy, this is Mike Fisher. I also, Marty Abbott was his longtime friend. Um, and uh, right now, Mike Fisher is the CTO at Etsy. Some of you know Etsy. Etsy is a poster child for Agile and one of the early leaders in doing product well. Um, but anyway, he is uh, both Marty Abbott and Mike Fisher were, went to West Point. U.S. Military Academy. Both of them went on to serve in special forces. And I don't think it's an accident that they are both two of the best leaders I've ever seen. And they wrote the main book for tech companies that are dealing with scale. It's called The Art of Scalability. Many of you, have, if you haven't heard about it, and if the companies or teams you coach are struggling with tech debt, that is considered the Bible. The Art of Scalability. They wrote it. But they really, uh, in fact, in the new edition of that book, I, uh, they, I asked them if I could republish one of the essays in there. It was just, I loved it. It talked about the difference between leadership and management. And I would argue there's probably nowhere in the country that focuses on true leadership and true management in the best sense of the word more than the military, than West Point. It's, it is literally a life or death thing for them. So the idea is leadership serves to inspire people to greater accomplishment, but management is there to motivate them to the objective. I'm going to talk about, even though I opened by sharing with you that I've been advocating strongly agile for years, I will also be the first to point out there are several unintended negative consequences of the trans transition from our, in our industry from waterfall to agile. And I would never go back to waterfall, don't get me wrong. But there's two things that really were unintended and, and really bad consequences. The first one is that a lot of managers, especially, when their companies brought in agile trainers and coaches, they kind of came out of that and they would often ask me, 
What's my job? Am I even needed? These teams are, you know, the agile coaches are telling me to back off. And here's the thing about agile, realistically. It doesn't require less management, it requires better management. It really does. The truth is, in Agile, especially with empowered teams, it's harder to be a good manager. Because the truth is, command and control is not very hard. It, and it comes naturally to most people. However, in an empowered team model, they've got a much bigger set of responsibilities. And that's what we need to talk about. And in a minute, I'll get to the other big negative consequence of the move to Agile. All right, let's talk about the roles and responsibilities of the actual leaders. And I'm talking about here especially the leaders in product, the leaders in design, the leaders in engineering, and the top of the company, usually CEO or a general manager. There are five big responsibilities of leaders. Now, here's the thing. This is all of what I'm about to say for the next several minutes is really not that important if you're a true startup. If you're just like 10 engineers, 15 engineers, so much of this is easier. Everybody knows what we're trying to do. There's clear focus. But as you grow in an organization, I think I learned earlier Nike's got on the order of 100 to 150 product teams and makes up the e-commerce experience, which is what you'd expect in a large-scale major brand. That is way harder way harder, and that's the real scale thing. But the point is, what we want to make sure is that if you want, if Nike wanted to have 100 empowered product teams, you have to give each of those teams the common vision and context so that all teams are going in the same direction. Otherwise, you end up with 100 different Nike.coms, which nobody wins. And you'd be surprised how many companies literally do that. It's just chaos. All right, so the first responsibility of the leaders is literally the product vision. Now, a lot of people are confused about product vision. They think like, oh, for Google, it's organize the world's information. That is not a product vision. That's a mission statement. I like it. Not helpful to those 100 teams that make up you know, YouTube or make up Google Search. Not helpful. They need a real product vision. Another common misunderstanding is they think each team should have a vision. Like, what are they thinking? The, you know, is it a surprise that they'd all go in 100 different directions? The point of the vision is to unify. The point of the vision is to give us that common mountaintop we're all going after. In the military, special forces, I learned they call that common intent. They need every squad, every cross-functional team to understand what the common objective is. That's the product vision. These product visions are compelling. This is actually the reason most good people join a company is because of the vision. They believe this is something they really want to work for uh, and contribute to. Uh, Elon Musk is very good at doing product visions. They're typically 10-year visions. People know what they're signing up for. They also know it might not be possible. That's part of the characteristics of a good vision. You're working on something that's worthy but hard. So. Um, Product vision is really the beginning. You know, that is true. People join because of a vision. I will also mention the main reason they leave, their manager, which is our next big topic. OK. Product strategy, a totally neglected area by most of the companies that have weak leaders and weak managers. Product strategy is actually what connects the dots between a vision and the individual product teams. If you've got a common vision for Nike.com, yet you have 100 product teams, we need a strategy that helps us guide the different teams, because they're not all the same. Some teams are working on things like search, and some are working on um, merchandise selection. Some are working on recommended products. There's all kinds of different teams different, contributing in different ways depending on how they structured the organization. Product strategy is what connects everything. That's a huge topic, product strategy. It's one of my favorite topics, but that is a huge one, mainly because it's different in every company. 
We all have different considerations. When Apple talks product strategy for the iPhone, it's different than, uh, say, Alexa. All right. Product principles really speak to the nature of the products you want to create. These are, these are a lot of people think it means uh, it should be easy to use or so. That's not product principles. These are supposed to tackle hard questions. Uh, and hard problems, the kind of thing that causes teams to really have a lot of uh, uh, often animosity between each other. Early eBay, actually, I'll give you an example quickly. Early eBay had four product teams, basically, early on. They had a buyer team, a seller team, a search team, and a trust and safety team. No problem. The thing is, all the money came from the seller team because it came from sellers, I should say. It came from sellers, so the seller team was all about helping those sellers. But some of the things they wanted to do, the buyer team started getting nervous. It actually got to the point where they were a lot more than nervous. They were freaking out. Because some of the things that the sellers wanted were, were clearly good for sellers, but actually clearly not good for buyers. So what do you do? Every company has things like this. What do you do? Well, they needed a product principle that really addressed this across the board. And, uh, and, and we did. It actually came from the founder, the founder Pierre Omidyar, which in their case, and I'm not arguing this applies to Nike or anybody else, in, the, in eBay's unique marketplace, they, Pierre emphasized that, look, yes, the, the money comes from the sellers, but there's really only one reason the sellers are at eBay. It's because that's where the buyers were. And if you piss off the buyers, doesn't matter how many features you give sellers, they're going to leave. So that's an example of a product. I mean, and literally, the product principle became, in the event the needs of the buyer conflict with the needs of the seller, we will consciously opt for the needs of the buyer, because that's the most important thing we can actually do for sellers. That's an example of a real product principle. Tesla has them about their cars. I mean, they're just all you can imagine. Everybody faces these kinds of dilemmas. This is, this is not something that's helpful to have 100 different product teams decide for themselves what their principles are. This is part of that common intent. Product priorities. The leaders, you might have, you know, I, I, am, no, I am not a fan of roadmaps. Uh, roadmaps in the common sense, which is a prioritized list of features and projects. The only reason I'm not a fan is because most of those features and projects, no matter how smart you are, you will regret. If you actually look at the analytics afterwards, how many of them actually did what you had hoped, or whoever vice president asked for the thing on the roadmap? So that's well documented. Microsoft publicly admitted to 10% of the items on their roadmaps actually panning out in the Harvard Business Re Review about a year ago. I was impressed that they admitted it. That's all. I knew it was true, but I, didn't, I was impressed that they admitted it. This is true everywhere. And the difference is the good teams know that. They don't pretend otherwise. So all the work you do, and if you magnify that by 100, all of the engineers out there building stuff, most of it, I promise you, is a waste of time. The root of that are these damn roadmaps. The thing is, roadmaps serve real purpose. The two big things are, the leaders want to know you're working on the most important thing, and some of the things you build, they need to know when it's going to happen. I can't help but, you know, I actually think Nike is probably the single best company in the world at marketing. I can only guess at what they spend on marketing campaigns for all their amazing production commercials and promotions. Who knows? But um, they need to know when something's going to happen. You can't just say, oh, we had a demo and we feel like we're good enough. You can launch the TV commercial. That's not how it works. They need to plan months in advance. And so leaders do need to say what the priorities are. That comes from leaders. All right, and the last one, and this is also very underappreciated in most companies. The, and this is nonlinear. The bigger the company gets, the more critical this is. Nonstop evangelism. The leaders have to constantly tell the story of what the vision is, why it's going to be worth the pain, what we're doing to mitigate the issues. You've got to do it nonstop. 
I have never seen a meaningful effort, initiative, transformation happen without nonstop evangelism. So those are the five big responsibilities of the actual leaders, the heads. Let's keep going. Uh, well, this is actually an example. I like to share examples of these really real people. Stacy's actually a licensed veterinarian, a vet. She, uh, I met her because she had, um, I met her because she was so frustrated. She ran a, a clinic in the Rocky Mountains and she was so frustrated with the horrible state of the technology available to vet offices. And in particular, she was felt she felt like animals were not getting the care they need because there was such terrible communication between vets, the vet tech staff, the pet owners, was terrible. And it was. She actually uh, brought in all the vendors, did trials, and realized it's terrible. And when she reached out to me, she said, is there any reason I can't do a startup uh, for pro uh, this? And I, no, I didn't see any reason. Um, I, I host these sessions once in a while in San Francisco for founders, and I invited her to that session. And so this is a vet. So I, well, the good news, obviously, it's a pretty smart person, <laughs> I mean, to be a vet but knew nothing about product, knew never even, you know, agile means uh, uh, Australian shepherd in a course, right? That's agile to her. And they, um, she learned all this stuff. She first learned product, then she hired a designer so she could work with this designer, then she ended up being an engineering manager, hiring two engineers, and they actually built a product that just swept the industry. Uh, they are just, uh, well, I mean, today, it's uh, a growth stage company. It is the major disruptive player in that industry. And I think it's awesome. The main thing, is she, if, if she had uh, even one minute with you, you'd probably be tearing up because she would tell you about all the unnecessary pain that animals suffer because of the lack of stuff like this. And uh, this is why, that what they were tackling. And yes, a great example of a leader. Okay, so now let's talk about management, the actual role of management. Steve Jobs, which everybody knows, I love this quote, doesn't make any sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. Hire smart people so they can really show us what we can do. And, uh, so, and I like that quote because so many people totally misunderstand his legacy and what he was really about. He was, not the, he was not at all the type of person that would say, this is what you need to do to fix it. He was the type of person to say, show me your prototype, give me 30 minutes, I'll tell you all the reasons it's terrible. He was very good at that. And by the time you had a prototype that he was like, finally, this is good, it was pretty awesome. So that's really the, he was great at product, but he didn't, well, he used his engineers, he used his designers. Great book came out recently, if you want to read it, uh, by, one, by the tech lead, tech lead in engineering, on the most critical part of the original iPhone, which was the ability to enter text on a 100% touchscreen device. Nobody had figured that out. And that was by far the biggest risk. They knew it was the biggest risk. I could talk for an hour on what they did in order to, dis their product discovery process at Apple, how design and engineering worked, with, worked to come up with really impressive prototypes to, to discover a solution that actually worked, and now the whole world uses it. But none of that existed before. And in fact, it was worse than that. Apple, if you remember, had a product called the Newton, which was a failure, which by their own analysis, their own sort of post-mortem afterwards, the number one reason the Newton failed was it was way too hard to enter text. So they were extra scared that that would be the same fate for the iPhone if they didn't solve that. And the book is called Creative Selection by one of the um, engineers called, uh, named Ken Kasinda. It's a really, it's written from the engineering perspective, but it's a really fun read and you can see how they did product discovery on a super hard problem. Okay. So let's talk about the role of management. There's really three huge responsibilities. And I, I wanna be clear, I'm talking about, 
I'm not talking about managers in sales or anything like that. I'm talking about the managers of product managers, the managers of designers, and the managers of engineers, dev managers, engineering directors, and up. It's those three managers especially, and in particular, the ones that manage individual contributors. I'm not talking about product managers or product marketing managers. I'm talking about people that manage people. Okay, three big responsibilities. The first is obviously staffing. And um, this is another major topic. I will tell you that I have never once in my, I've been doing tech products for 35 years now. I have never once met a company where HR actually helped with that in any meaningful way. <laughs> this is not HR. If you think HR will help you get to these empowered product teams, you've already failed. This is on the hiring manager. This is on the hiring manager. So if you are you know, an engineering dev manager, this is on you to find the right engineers. Okay. Now, we'll talk about a lot of people are really hiring for the wrong things. So I'm gonna dive into that. They are often ignoring the best people they could hire and they're focused on the wrong things. So we'll talk about that. The biggest responsibility, though, for a manager is to develop their people. And this is one of those that has really gone south in our industry. When I, uh, I started my career as a developer for the first 10 years, I was writing software. I worked at HP Labs. It was a good place to learn how to, the craft of sort of software engineering. But I didn't realize until after I left HP, and I kind of went out into the real world, uh, and I, I didn't realize how lucky I was. Because for that entire 10 years, every single day, there was at least one manager where that person had an explicit responsibility to coach me. Normally it was get them, you know, get the person, in this case me, to competence, and then get the person ready for the next step. I just thought that was normal. Today, that's the exception. I talk to people all over and I'm like, where in the world did you learn product? Because it's nothing like what we're talking about. And they're like, well, nowhere. Or, okay, this is the second big unintended consequence of Agile. Unfortunately, and I know this wasn't intentional, but it is a serious plague in our industry. The most common answer I get was, I took a CSPO course. Which, of course, I recommend people take a CSPO course if they're using something like Scrum. For sure, they should know the rituals. That does not teach you to be a product manager. It really doesn't. It's just as useless as taking a course on JIRA. Yes, you should know it, but you're not a product manager. And you know that's a new phenomenon. It used to be that product people knew they had a lot to learn, but now they've been assigned, oh, you're a product owner. They usually come from like project management or business analyst role, something like that. And they're told, you are now product owner, congratulations. Yeah, you're gonna go to a training, we're gonna send you to product owner training. Oh my, it's nothing. It's not even 10% of the job. So this is a serious unintended consequence. Now, when I say serious, the CEOs are complaining to me that they've never seen such bad product people. Because they have a very different expectation. They could care less about the rituals of a scrum team. And by the way, why the heck should they care? That's sausage making. They care about like, does this person know how to actually, in fact, in the modern product world, we talk about on, on an empowered team, the product manager being the CEO of a product, which CEOs love that because they know what that really means. It's not being the boss of anybody. It means that you understand all the dimensions of the business, how it's sold, how it's marketed, how it's funded, how it brings revenue, what are the compliance issues. The only other job in a company like that is really the CEO. That's what it means. And they're like, you met this person. Now, they don't use the term backlog administrator, but that's what they're describing. So a product owner is not a product manager, and we have a real problem in our industry with that. Now, I do tell product managers they really need to be the product owner, because if you don't, if you separate those two, 
<coughs> excuse me, causes a whole different level of pathology. I'm starting to lose my voice here. <coughs> and that is bad. So <coughs> yes, the product manager should be the product owner, but that is not the job. It's just the role they play on an agile team. Hopefully you guys get that, but it is a real problem. Make sure your product people learn the real responsibilities they have. That's just like, to me, it's just as ludicrous as thinking an engineer is trained as an engineer if they take a scrum class. It doesn't teach you how to code. It's the same point. All right, so the biggest responsibility for leaders, for managers, is to actually and actively coach their people to competence. Uh, I focus a lot on those that coach product managers because to me that's the biggest area that's really fallen down. But it also applies for design and it definitely applies for engineering. In the engineering it's a lot less stress because we, it's not just one person. A product team, a typical product team does have one product manager, one product designer, but they have anywhere from two to ten or so engineers. So you know it's not really a problem if you've got one senior engineer, two or three with a few years experience, and maybe one or two that are college hires. I actually think that's healthy. But it's a bigger issue with product and design. Or there's also a lot of attention on that tech lead. That's a critical role as well. All right, so coaching is critical. And the third one is, in the empowered team model, rather than being given roadmaps of features, you're given problems to solve. Those are objectives, business objectives, to be clear, business objectives. An objective is not release every week. That's, not, that's a vanity objective. I mean, I sh they should be releasing no less than every two weeks. That's a whole other conversation. Otherwise, it's bad for our customers and bad for us. But I'm not talking about that. I mean an objective like our, num our amount of sales internationally at Nike is way too low, and we have to improve that. That's a problem for the business. That's a business objective. If you're told today, I may, I'm making these numbers up, I have no idea what Nike's real numbers are, but let's just say that today, 1%, uh, people that try to go buy from Europe, they only 1% actually convert. That would be way too low. And so to be able to go to a product team, team and say, figure out what's going on and fix it, we need to get to a minimum of 4% to have a sustainable business where our marketing is not wasted. So that's objectives. And the, the manager's job is to give each product team, each squad, objectives. Uh, I'm, I am an advocate of the OKR system. Uh, that is, but I have to have a big caveat because the OKR system, in fact, it's already starting a backlash which like everything, you've probably seen that many times. Because the OKR system is designed around the empowered team model, that's where it came from, that's who it's for, the companies that are poster children for it are in this model I'm advocating, but the vast majority of companies that are trying to adopt it are in the feature team model where it is a complete mismatch. And it causes this ridiculous game people play to, to still have roadmaps and yet try to pacify people about OKRs. It's a mashup, it's contrived. That's what's going on, it's a mismatch. But in the empowered team model, that's how it works. Instead of giving teams a roadmap, you, the leaders give, the managers give the teams problems to solve. And uh, they had the team, this is what it actually means to be empowered. They are asked to solve these problems in ways our customers love, and I mean real customers. I'm not talking about internal employees. Real customers and customers love, but work for our business, like customer service agents and, and uh, accounting, finance, whatever. All right, so those are the three big responsibilities of managers. Christian is actually one of the best people managers I have ever seen. He's. Um, He's actually a very accomplished head of product. Um, I met him years ago, and I love this quote of his, every problem is a people problem. But I first met him because I was so impressed by this team uh, of product people in Richmond, Virginia, which is not known as a tech capital. And uh, I asked them where they learned their craft, and 
They pointed me to Christian, and he is just, I've been a fan ever since. I've seen him truly transform. No BS transformation. He led the transformation at Merrill Corporation, which some of you should look up. And I don't mean for the Nike people, Merrill Shoes. I mean Merrill Financial. This is, um, they do hardcore financial software for things like mergers and acquisitions. And this is a big, old company. Everything you would put as a poster child for not transformed. Uh, and he, they turned the whole thing around to be a le the leader in their industry and now actually the most desirable place to work in there. They're headquartered in Minneapolis. That kind of transformation, honestly, very few people have ever pulled off. And uh, I think I know most of them that have pulled it off. And he's one of them. But anyway, he does his own boot camp. He developed his own curriculum to train his people. And he takes it personally. That's his biggest responsibility, is to develop the skills of his team. Because that's the key to these empowered product teams, which is the key to the business results they're all looking for. All right. So let's get back to this idea of trust. Some of you may, may know Stephen Covey, he also passed away. But he's, uh, I love this definition. Of all the definitions out there of trust, this is my favorite. Um, it's a function of two things. It depends on two things. You need competent people. And really, you don't have anything without that competence. So that is critical. We'll talk about that. And you need character. And we're going to talk about both of them. So let's talk about uh, competence first. So when I said the recruiting often is right, the staffing is often where things fall down, this is really what I'm talking about. So often, you know, honestly, it's, it's even more basic than this. A lot of times the managers have never seen good. So is it any surprise that they can't hire good? It's just, you've probably heard the old saying of uh, A's hire A's, but B's hire C's. I see it all the time. You get some manager of product management, some manager of design that has never actually seen it done well, either one, and they're responsible, obviously, for hiring. It's part of their job, and they honestly don't know what to look for. And they end up hiring people that, you know, they all want to hire like Google people, but those Google people don't want to go work for them. And so they struggle with that. They're like, oh, well, I need a 10Xer or something. And what they end up doing what they end up doing is hiring really the wrong people. They really need to focus on getting people that are competent. They need to learn what competence is. And it's OK to hire by potential. I love to do that myself, and I encourage. But I tell hiring managers, only hire on potential if you personally are willing to commit that you will coach that person on a daily basis to get them to competence. And if you can't, you have to find that person another job. Because this is your, what you're signing up for. So we, we really need the managers to step it up here, is bottom line for that. So competence is critical. Character is not talked about enough. Um, now, the way I like to describe character, some of you may know the New Zealand All Blacks, but they're the most successful sports franchise of any type in the world. Isn't that interesting? Over 100 years. I mean, I don't know. If we, I was looking if they have the swoosh on there. Sorry that they might not. But, um, <laughs> but they are literally the most successful across the world, across sports, across time. And they, uh, they're an institution. They have a very special culture. And one of the aspects of this place is that they only they, they know that no matter how amazingly talented an athlete or a coach is, we don't want assholes. And they are very explicit about that. They have learned that those people are toxic to the team. And this is one of the most important concepts. Google likes to be more politically correct than me. They call it psychological safety, which is basically the term for when you don't have assholes on your team. And this is a real problem, though. There's actually a Stanford Business School professor wrote a book. His name is Bob Sutton, wrote a book called The No Asshole Rule. Uh, and it, it really is a thing. 
And forget, you know, it, it really is frustrating because what I see all the time is that teams, the hiring managers, what they're really trying to do, they, they call it cultural fit. That's what they want, they want cultural fit. But you know what that means to most people? Because it, of course, it's what the heck does that really mean? But to most people, it means hire people that look like you and think like you. And that, it just kills me because what does that mean really? It means that they're like white guys that went to the same colleges and studied the same things. And they miss the point entirely. Because what we really want is people that don't think like you. Really, that is critical. That's, that's, in fact, it's pretty obvious to me why we have such a diversity issue in tech. I'm not even making that argument that it's better for the world. It is, but I'm just saying, you'll have a way better product team if you actually hire competent people of character and don't worry about cultural fit. All right. So, let me talk about the people that actually make up these great teams. Now, I'm intentionally picking people that are very ordinary. None of them are MIT trained, kind of like rock star people, that, but they are all members of awesome teams. That's, by the way, the big thing Google learned when they studied what makes great teams. They're not the rock stars, actually. They're very ordinary employees that are not assholes and they do amazing things together. So, Adi's actually a product manager at a company called Augury in Israel. I, uh, I will tell you, I'm, a lot of the best product teams I've ever met are in Israel, and I will also say, in Israel, it's the one part of the world, Silicon Valley included, but the one part of the world where an empowered product team is the norm, not the exception. And you know where, why they do that? Because what they learn all of them at 18, males and females, they have to serve in the armed forces. And uh, you know, in high school, based on your grades, they actually select what you're gonna do. And they, that's where most of the developers are actually trained to be developers. But the difference is they're all trained by outcome. They are literally told, and I, I met one group that literally is part of their, they were working on uh, anti-terrorism measures. And they were told several times that look, this is a real threat, this is not an exercise. If you don't figure out a way to detect this, people will die. That's outcome oriented, to be clear. And it's not about features, it's about results. And that's my theory about why there are so many amazing product teams there. And it's a tiny little country populated by people from every culture in the world. So that's my theory. Design, so many people in engineering and in product management have never actually had the chance to work with a real product designer. They are awesome, and you'll never go back once you have that. But they are just great at thinking, at coming up with solutions to hard problems. That's what designers do. They're not there to make the, you know, the, the swoosh the right size with the right pixels. They're there to solve hard problems. You've all heard Steve Jobs. It was a famous line about uh, design is not look and feel, it's how the whole product works. These people are awesome, and they're often missing from an empowered product team, and it's very hard to do this stuff without them. And then engineers, the main thing with the engineers, and especially I'm talking tech leads here, we need people that are willing to do a lot more than just build whatever they're told to build. Good product teams, this is one of the characteristics of an empowered product team, is that they have absolutely the ability to say this is a dumb idea, we're not gonna build it. In fact, we encourage them to say that. Because there's two possibilities there. One is that they're right, it's a dumb idea. The product manager's just copying Amazon.com or some other company. Or, more very possible, the product manager is not shared with the, the engineers the reason this is so important. So they're not convinced. But we need engineers that are willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the uh, product managers and even CEOs. Lindsay is a beautiful example of that. She's fearless. All right. So let me just finish up with this idea of truly empowered product teams. I'm trying to convince more companies to at least give it a try. At least give it a try. Try working like these companies I've been talking about and see if it doesn't work out better than what you're doing now. The first thing is they really need to be cross-functional. 
Now, I, I don't, so I'm not just talking about, again, different uh, engineering skills. I mean real product management, real product design, and engineering. They have to also um, have character or not be an asshole. And that is critical because the team has got to trust each other, work together closely. Second is what it means to be empowered, really. It do, they don't get to work on anything they want. That's not what that is. What they get to do is figure out the best way to solve the problems they've been asked to solve. So if they've been asked to solve you know, international purchases for Nike.com, they get to figure out they have to figure out a way to solve that problem. You know, there's a hundred things you could consider, but rather than some executives getting together once a quarter and giving you a roadmap, the team figures out the best way they think. They try it. If it doesn't work, they try something else. And they're not done until they solve it. That's an empowered team, which leads to the last point, which is they are accountable. They are actually accountable for the results. By the way, that's what CEOs want, but of course they can't hold them accountable unless they empower them. Last thing I'll mention is this book just came out, uh, finally, um, on what I consider the best coach in our industry, Bill Campbell. And it, it is, for everybody that coaches product teams, to me this is by far the best book you can read. And he is... Awesome. This is, uh, it was actually written by Eric Schmidt and John Jonathan Rosenberg, you may know, former head of product and former CEO at Google, that were personally coached by him, and they collected quotes from many others that were coached by him, and they just shared the lessons. But you can really get a sense of what it really means to set up a team to do great work. Because you know it's, uh, hopefully you know this, it's not about process. It's really about the people, the culture, the techniques, setting them up to show what they can do. All right, I ran a little over. I apologize for that. Um, I do have written a book, though. It's on the discovery techniques. I am actually working on another book now about this topic of empowered product teams. But I genuinely appreciate you guys all staying for this last talk, and I hope it was useful. Thank you very much.